Okay, let's welcome Sid. Kadish, welcome Sid. Who's going to, um, Dr. Sid, who's going to do a teaching on chap, uh, Mishnah, we're not sure. He said Mishnah five, it may be Mishnah four and a half of chapter two of Pirkei Avot. And now Oops. you guys Sorry. do whatever you want to do. I'm out of here. No, I'm really here. We do a bracha. Should we change? Like we the, do a bracha. Let me. I have that out right. here for you all. You ready? Yes. Aruch. Um, I don't know. Can I do it in English? Uh, what? May I do it in English and then we can go in Hebrew? Sure. Okay. All Israel are destined to possess life eternal, as it has been written by people. There is righteousness in each of them. They will possess the realm of life everlasting. They are a plant I raised, the work of my hands, in whom I may be glorified. Okay, we can do it in Hebrew. Call Yisrael together with me. Call Yisrael. Marty and Roberta, you're reading two different things. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, that's yes. funny. I'm reading out of the boxer uh, thing. Hey, somebody else go ahead then. That's too confusing. Go ahead, Martin. Go ahead, Marty. Baruch Atad or Nai Elohim Elacholam Asher Kitchana Bitzvotav Tzivano La Sok B'Dibre Torah. Amen. Amen. Oh, okay. That's that's not the one specific one for Pierre Kavo. Oh, there's a oh, there's oh one sorry. Oh. Oh. oh, my God. Asham knew. I, I, I'm, it's, sorry. Uh, it's, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's nothing wrong with the one that you just read, though. I no, think it'll be very good. It's a good one. So, we're go. Yotze. Yala. We're Yotze with Martin's Bracha. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I want to greet you. I want to say Shabbat Shalom to you. And I'm glad we can get together to go over this because, frankly, the Torah reading was. Parshat, Mitzora, and um, Tazria. Tazria, and it's it's very medical, and it's very it's a little boring. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> Martin has put the the text up here, and uh, the text Martin is using is strange because in the Sidur, in the Sidur, it's down as. Uh, Perak uh, Bet, the, the second chapter, and then the fifth verse. But in this one, it's all glommed together. So if you look down in this Hebrew paragraph, the second one, and you go after the first word, it says Hillel Omer. Yeah, you said uh, it's, made a, it's made a, every time we do this through the years, depending on which source you use, different sources break it up differently. My my things are all marked up for where it is in Sim Shalom versus where it is in other texts. So, well, Meta, uh, Shabbat Shalom to you. I don't see your picture here, but I hear your sweet voice. <laughs> nice to hear. Nice to see you here. Or nice to hear you here. Okay, so what I want to do here is start with this verse: Hillel Omer Al Tifrosh Min Hatzibur, which is translated. Do not separate yourself from the community. That's okay. what Hillel said. Now, some people have interpreted this to mean just go with the flow. Don't, do, don't be an outsider, an outlier. Just go with the flow. To my mind, this means you need to work to the toward improvement on a community-wide basis. He's saying something that we all know, and that is to be a Jew means you have to be part of a community, and you shouldn't separate yourself from the community. And I have here my rabbi art scroll tells me that where it says Tzibur, the word Sibur, he says, is a, an acronym. It really comp is comprised of Tzadi, which is for Tzadikim, righteous people. Bet, Benonim, middle people. 
average Joes, and Resh, which is Rishaim, and the Tzibur consists of Tzadikim, Benonim, and Rishaim. And lest you think that that's hyperbole, I'm reminded that when Israel was fighting its war of independence, we had people like, um, uh, what was that? What was that gangster who, who uh, had, uh, lived in Havana and he- oh. Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky, uh. right. And Lansky helped out a lot, sent arms and so on. And he was a Russia, you know, he was, he was not uh, a, a big tzaddik, but he contributed too. And you, uh, um, I, I said before, uh, uh, before I saw your picture, Ellen and Maida, that I'm teaching a course on Zionism in, at the HILR. So Zionism was an idea but it succeeded in the establishment of the state of Israel, as you know, 73 years ago, we just celebrated Yom Atzmaut. And in large measure, the reason it succeeded was because of a community effort, an effort that all the Jewish people were asked to help, whether they put their nickels in a, in a pushki box to help buy land, remember that? Mm -hmm. Or, or they sent arms illegally to to Palestine, like this guy Dewey Stone, who was active here locally, did. Yes, there are many of them, and I knew some of them. That, that oh, really? you would know all the gangsters. I'd love to right? learn about that. You would know all the gangsters. Yeah, no, no, they weren't gangsters. They were tzaddikim. They were they actually a guy that made coats, uh, overcoats, was shipping overcoats to Israel. Nobody caught it, and they put arms in the bottom of each crate. Very good. Wow. The the book that Rich Cohen wrote on uh, Zam Zemansky, the banana king, yes. he also, they Zemuri. strongly suspected it too. Yeah, Samuel Zamuri. So I would invite anybody who has something to discuss the uh, mm principle of al tifrosh Minatsipur. David? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, short anecdote. Uh, I have, uh, I had two aunts and uncles who lived in B'nai Brak. Um, and I, I lived in Ramat Gan, just very close by. And walking through B'nai Brak, I noticed a street named Rehov Yochanan Hasandlar, Yochanan the Sandal Maker Street. Right. And I had I thought that was pretty curious, but I had no idea who it was until I started studying Pirkeavot, and realized that Yochanan Hasandlar was one of the sages, and was probably called Hasandlar because to differentiate him from all the other Yochanans. Right. But but it makes the point that. He was not a full-time sage. He was also a sandal maker. Those and that each of the sages had outside occupations. Right. And having an outside occupation was considered an essential part uh, of the uh, of uh, of life for for all of them. When uh, earlier today uh, the uh, the clergy in their Talmud class were talking about. Uh, how Yochanan ben Zakkai got uh, Vespasian uh, to allow him to continue the academy at uh, Yavne. And was there something elitist about uh, that request? And uh, I think uh, this, this teaching in Pirkei Avod is an answer to that, uh, to that thought that it was that uh, it was not an elitist institution, that all of the sages made a point of being part of the community. Um, and that those who study today full time uh, without uh, believing that it's necessary for them to make a living are, uh, are missing an important point. 
I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just reminded that what you're talking about is the subject of another chapter. And I'm looking for it, but I can't find it. But it says that you have to have Torah in Derech Eretz. And the, the term Derech Eretz, which for most of us means politesse, you know, manners, behaving nicely in, in society. But in the, in the Pirkei vote, it meant just what you said, which is to have a profession or to have a way where you make money to support yourself and you're not um, a, a draw on the community. Sid, I see that in um, chapter two, uh, verse two of the section two. <clears throat> Study of Torah is commendable when combined with a gainful occupation for when a person toils in both, sin is driven out of the mind. I don't know if that's, I don't know if there are others, but that's well, I why. think that's exactly right. And good for you for finding that. Thank you very much, Esther. That's great. That's great. Now, I'd like to say one more thing about this business about al Rosh Zippur. And that is, the rabbis felt that communal prayer was much more efficacious than individual prayer, which is why there's a big push to be in a minion. A minion, a minion, as you know, consists traditionally of 10 men and in, in our conservative movement, 10 men or women. But the rabbis say it's a lot better, it, prayer is more effective if you're gathered together, not by, by yourself. Don't you think that the same thing sort of is manifest in our mourning process? So until the time of burial, which is almost immediate, the mourner can do anything. But after that, he is part of the community and for an entire year, he can't say Kaddish unless he's part of a minion. So the community, he has to be part of the community. You can't isolate yourself when you're mourning. That's, Even then. That's a very good point. It's a beautiful point. And I must say that when my mother died about 12 years ago, I suddenly felt the thrust of the community. The community functions in, in cases like that. And it comes to you. It, it davens with you. It brings food. It, it supports you. It's a most wonderful thing. It and I, I have to tell you that I've been to you know, wakes for for my Gentile colleagues. And it's not the same thing at all. Not at all. They go to a funeral home, they walk by the deceased. The deceased is usually dressed up in a fine suit and they genuflect in front of the deceased. They, they greet the, the widow and then they move on. Anyhow. Sid, I think Bob Raymond wanted to say something. Okay, I can't see Bob here on the picture, but I'd love to hear from and, Bob. And uh, Sue Bergman wanted to say something earlier. So I, I, I just wanted to reflect on the, the issue of mourning um, because I, I think that Judith may have been getting at this. As, as much as it's helpful for the community to be supportive of us, it is so important for the mourner to not just re, you know, re, re, restrict himself or herself to being alone. Um, and I think that the wisdom of our of our tradition is such that we just don't let someone um, fester their 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 grief, but encourages them and in fact mandates them to be with a group of at least ten people to at least say kaddish. And so, as much as the community is supportive for that person, the same thing it it, it we're mandated to not be alone um, during the period of that eleven months. Um, it's an extraordinarily brilliant uh, tradition and, and insight about the mourning process. Thank you, Bob. I think you're Sue, right. Sue Bergman, I think, wanted to say something all the way from Switzerland. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to play devil's advocate a little bit um, in terms of how do you make yourself part of a community? I think everybody has different talents and different weaknesses. So not everybody can do the same thing. So, um, 
the way that I have heard, you know, full-time learners explain it is that, you know, they're doing their part uh, in the world above uh, rather than doing uh, whatever is uh, expected on earth. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it who knows, it might. Well, I, I sure agree with you. In other words, yes, we, we know that talents are distributed and some people can do great things and some people can do very plain things. And when I see uh, Hadassah women, for yeah. instance, um, just organizing an event where there's food and drink and now a speaker can get up and speak and everybody can resonate with the speak. You know, some of that is not glorious work, but that's contributing to building the community. And I, I think, I honestly think that, uh, I hope I'm not saying the wrong thing here, but, you know, right now we're, we're looking at the black community. They're enraged because, because some, Black youths and men and uh, are being, uh, you know, injured and killed, and they're trying to get themselves organized. They want to raise the, the, uh, the sense that Black Lives Matter. But I think that the Jewish people have done a very good job about that. We we're not marching in the street that we matter because we have we are well organized to help one another in a number of ways. Now, I'll, I'll tell you one last thing and then I'll quit talking. I'm on the list, as I'm sure many of you are, of every Jewish charity known to man. <laughs> and a few that aren't. <laughs> and because I subscribe to something called the Biblical Archaeology Review, I often get solicitations from Christian organizations. Well, a few years ago, I had an envelope I didn't recognize, and I opened it up, and it said, in the name of Allah, the all-merciful, I said, Ramadan has passed. Let's remember the widows and the orphans. <laughs> and somehow they, they got a hold of my, my address, my name and address. I'm just saying, this is how we do it. We have, a, we have millions of different charities, but it works. It's yep. effective in it, and it, and it has helped build our Jewish community. And when we look at our history, from let's say when we were little children and the Holocaust was going on, the Jewish community was not so well organized and was not effective. Okay, I'm done talking. Who else has something to say? Nobody. Okay, so let's move on. I have. I do have something to say. Wait, you said sorry. Oh, Carol, um, I don't have my camera on, sorry. Um, I just want to, I just can't let what you say go by without us acknowledging that for the majority of, Jew, of the Jewish community, we also, we may organize ourselves, but we also have white privilege. That's I just want true. that to be part of why we are, why we are, let's just say better off. And I'm putting, even though you can't see me, I'm putting that in air quotes. I just didn't want to let that go by. So. Okay. In other words, said uh, it's uh, your comparison of the black community to the Jewish community is uh, uh, problematic. Okay. Thank you. I, yes, I, David. I'm not going to stand there and argue with you because I appreciate what you're saying and I'm in sympathy with the fact that those poor folks came over here in the holds of boats to become slaves. I understand. But that's a subject that I probably should move on from because it's not going to be useful to argue about that. But um, also, I think a, a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people in our country do not connect with the Jewish community as a community. They don't join Jewish organizations or contribute to Jewish charities or participate in Jewish, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Yom Ha'atzma'ut or something. So 
I think that while we have lots of um, avenues to be part of our community, a lot of people, maybe a majority, don't partake. It's a, gro it's a growing problem with um, the younger generation that they, um, they're, they're Jewish, but in a, and they acknowledge that they're Jewish, but in a sort of overall, so not spiritual necessarily, because m most of them are not observant, um, I, but they don't partake at all. They don't affiliate themselves with Jewish organizations, certainly not with Israel. Um, and I, it's a problem, how to, how to reverse that is a big problem. What you're saying is, is a challenge for our community. Yeah. yeah. It is a challenge. Now, I'm not a Jewish professional. I, I, I get stuff in camera that they're reaching out to young people and so on. But I, I really, they, the leadership that I'm aware of, like CJP, they know about this. They know about this. They know this yeah. is a challenge before them. And of course, we're not going to have a viable Jewish community unless we have young people coming along and and taking their place along uh, along those of us who are kind of retiring and dropping out because of age. Well, look, it, unfortunately, I not, can say, I'm sorry. It's not, it's Meta. It's not just a Jewish problem. I mean, it's one of the dynamics of the culture of, um, I'll say the United States, because I don't know enough about the rest of the world, but people do need communities, did, but they are finding their communities in other ways other than Jewish institutions, because they can. Yeah. And that was not always the case. It also brings in something that Carol, you know, it, it kind of weaves the thread that Carol brought up back into the, the discussion. Um, we do have white privilege here in the United States, but I'm not sure that privilege would have carried over when communities were less mobile. Um, and certainly in Europe, um, you know, uh, we didn't have privilege. And I think that we are in a position to um, at least begin to understand um, the black community and reach out to, to them. Um, but I think that this is at least a piece of why our kids um, feel that, um, you know, here we are, we're doing so well and now we're oppressing other people. Well, they obviously don't know the history of the civil rights movement when Jews were among the only groups that consistently <laughs> supported the blacks. Right, and we need to do that now too. But we are. I, I, I think well, consistently more than any other group. Well, uh, I think the uh, the problem for problem for the Jewish world goes back to uh, our emancipation in Europe when we were no longer confined to ghettos and could be part of the greater world. Suddenly we had choices. Oh, yeah. And this has happened through history. It, it, it almost seems that, you know, it goes in a cycle where, um, you know, you, you get accepted by a given community, you assimilate into it. Um, the Jewish community loses a significant portion of uh, its number and um, anti-Semitism rises up and kind of uh, puts everybody in their place again. Which is a very odd argument when you stop and think about it, that other people's hatred of us is what unifies us. It's well, pretty sad. It's, yeah, let's hope that we have more than that going for us. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, this is the challenge before no, all of wants us. to say something, I Go think. Ahead. Bob, weren't you about uh, to say something? Yeah, I, I just, I, I, I sort of hate to change, to change the subject, so you can just mute me if you think. I, I just, I was reading in this chapter of um, Empirical Care of Votes, something that is so famous and yet, I didn't remember the end of this of the um, line, and it, it's um, 
at least in my book, it's it, it's a verse twenty one, where um, I think they're they're quoting Rabbi Tarfon, and I think we all have heard him say, you know, it's not for you to complete the task, but neither are you free to stand away from it. So that's one of the most famous lines I think in 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 Mishnah amongst many famous lines. But what I what I didn't know, I didn't remember reading in the same line was that the reward of the righteous is granted in the time to come. So that I think they're already putting sort of a um, you know, a theodicy there and saying, you know, if you're righteous, you do all the right things. But, you know, Bible says you're supposed to get rewarded. And they're saying, well, you may not know about it because it may not come until the time to come. And I thought that was really sort of a, an interesting caution there uh, because, uh, you know, again, everything we learn in, 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 in school is, you know, do the right thing and you're going to be, you're going to have a good life. And I think he's, he's, he's cautioning us there. And I, I didn't remember that in this, you know, the beginning is so famous and the end is sort of not talked about. So but that was an interesting caution. Thank you. Okay, what I'd like to do now, if every, if we have a, hello? We're here. Hello? We're here. If well, we've yeah. exhausted the concept of Alta Frosh Minatsibur, let's move on. It says here, the next thing it says is Al, and that, the translation of that is, do not be sure of yourself until the day of your death. Do not be sure of yourself until the day of your death. It means... You have the wrong page on the screen. <laughs> no, it, it's, it was the right page. It was just covered by the... Yeah, two two. it was there, it was just at the bottom. Oh. All right, you see it now? Yeah, I have one in front of me, so it's okay. <laughs> Can everybody else see it? Do not trust in yourself until the day of your death. What does that mean? According to Rabbi Art Scroll, it means don't be too arrogant. Don't believe that you are secure despite financial and professional success. One can only be certain of a good character if it is put to the test. And my sense about the, the rabbis who wrote this is they felt that some of their numbers flipped into heresy later in life as they were exposed to more of the Hellenistic influences that surrounded them. So they said, don't think that you're totally secure until the day of your death. Does anybody I, have any I, comments? I think about of this. That? Sorry, uh, I think of this as saying, uh, uh, "Live every day as though it could be your last." That whatever it is that you uh, you need to do, whatever it is that you feel like you should be doing, that it's the right thing to do. Don't put it off. Well, I don't see the connection between this pasuk and um, Hellenization or assimilation. What I do see it as is a warning to the community in general. Don't be so secure in your place in the world. I mean, they can come and destroy you at any time. And this was written probably during the Roman occupation of, um, right. right, so, uh, you never know when the Romans are come down on your neck and, and, and which in fact did happen. Well, I, I think of it more as a personal injunction. Uh, oh. Uh, but you could look at it, if, with all of these, you could look at it either way. Uh, uh, of course. I, I, the sense I had from the reading I did was that there were people and they cited these people who flipped into heresy later in life. And that's true, you, you know, we all can change. We all can change. So Hillel is saying, don't believe in yourself until the day of your death means that's when you're done making changes. Okay, and then the okay. next- He's saying you don't know what you're gonna to do tomorrow 
if um, somebody rams you on purpose when you're driving around 128 and you get real angry about it when you think of yourself as, you know, you may get into some road rage or something like that. You don't know what's going to happen in these situations. Correct. That is certainly correct. And I can, can I add, I actually have um, one of the, um, Abraham Tversky's um, visions mm -hmm. of the fathers. And he did a lot of work with, with addiction. And he uses this um, part of Pierre Kayev vote to talk about people who, who are uh, alcoholics. And even though they're in recovery and have and been sober for many years, they're never sure whether it's gonna last. And so he gives an example. He said they can't um, believe that they're truly recovered until they die. So um, he has a little more detail, but it's an interesting you know, type of problem that, or I mean, people with a lot of changed habits or addictions or whatever, there's always a struggle, uh, there's often a, still a struggle at various times. So anyway, that's Tversky um, who sadly, uh, passed away recently, his interpretation. Very good. So uh, just one modern twist on that, and that is uh, what Hillel is really saying is to wear a mask, even though you've had your vaccine, because you can't be <laughs> sure uh, of, of, of anything. Excellent. Can you hear soon? <laughs> so then the next line is, Al tadin et chavercha ad shetagia lemkomo, which in the Siddur it says, do not judge your fellows till you stand in their situation. You can't, you, we know this, you have to walk in somebody else's shoes before you can be very judgmental. Anybody have any comments about that? I well, think that's, please. Uh, well, it's, yes, we say this in many different ways, but uh, essentially uh, uh, we, uh, it, it, you're not necessarily going to condone or excuse bad behavior uh, when you see it in, in someone else, but you also should understand why they're doing it, uh, it may not be because they are bad people. It may be because of things that are beyond their control. Um, or uh, it may be because they, uh, they're they facing a, a different set of circumstances. I think you're right, David. I'm reminded so of a sermon. Sorry, who, go ahead. I think circumstances, you don't know all the circumstances. I think you're right. I agree with you. Martin? I said about the same thing that Wes, Wes had a sermon years ago, the same thing that somebody may appear on the outside to look like they've got everything in control. They're good looking, they're well dressed, they're this or that, but you have no idea what's gone on in the past. Uh, they could have had a child that died. They, they could have been uh, ill. They could have had a financial reversal. You have no idea uh, what people have in their background. I was just wondering why these verses are all grouped together. And so far, it's all extensions of separating yourself from the community. In other words, put your be with other people. Think about why they do what they do. Not, not just you yourself, but I can't fit it in with the last sentence. Okay, so uh, the only answer I could give you is, these are quotes from Rabbi Hillel. Yes, but why put them all together in this one place? I mean, it, as opposed to in, in some other section. I, I, can't, I can't answer that. No. But we need to have the editor of this piece who put it together give you the answer. I have well, an answer no. from this book, which is from um, okay. Leonard Kravitz or Litsky and Plout, that says, it would seem that Hillel's statement should begin a new Mishnah. However, in the printed texts of the Mishnah and the complete Talmud, 
Hillel's statement is included with Rabbi Gamliel's statement that begins this Mishnah. So it's something that's, the return to the statement of Hillel may indicate that some original differences occurred when the Mishnah was redacted. And that's what they say, Gunther Plaut. That's what he says. Great, that's a great answer. Um, okay. Yeah, I can, sorry, I can see it put together as related to each other because in a sense, it's a guideline for how to live uh, in community and influenced by study, never assuming, um, ne never taking yourself um, in a sense too seriously within the community and never forgetting that the others in the community have stories that you have no idea about. And all of that together defines a way to live a life. So I can see that they're related enough. Oh no, I, I could see the relationship. It was, I was having a little difficulty with the last sentence, but what you say makes perfect sense. Maida, thank you. You've tied this up very nicely. You've tied this up very nicely. And okay. I, and I Go was, ahead, Ellen. yeah, and also, um, you know, I agree, of course, that we say that um, you shouldn't judge a person until you've walked in his shoes in the sense of you don't know what he's facing, okay? But in addition, even if you know what another person is facing or what they've been through, you still don't know how you would react to it, you know? You can say, oh, well, if that happened to me, I would do thus and such. So I think it's even, you know, I think there's like kind of two ways around it. One, you don't know uh, what's causing someone to do something, but then in addition, even if you knew it, you might think you would act in a certain way, but you don't know unless you actually experienced it. I agree with you. I, I, I often I've thought about what would I do if I were a, a teenager in the in the middle of the Holocaust. You know what what would I have done? And you know again, it's very hard to make judgments about what other people did. Uh, there's a sadness to the Holocaust story because in many respects the people simply complied with the orders that they the order is to get get on a train, they got on the train and so on. But it's very hard to say, I wouldn't have done that. I, I would have offered resistance, right. you know? Yeah. Okay. I have I have one opposite take from another source. Uh, oh, it's a Ravenel on Pirkei Avot, but he cites a lot of other rabbis. So this is Rabbi Moshe al Shakpar. I never heard of it. Anyway, it's the reverse. It says, do not judge your fellow man. The stranger who appears in your community should not be extolled as an exceptionally righteous person until you have investigated his background. Um, <laughs> yeah, they know him better. But it's the reverse. Whoa. It's giving somebody accolades and praise. But also, you don't know the full picture. That's right. So like, don't judge know. them by their appearance. Or, right. or it was Bernie Madoff in his early years. Right, right? he just died. Right, he, yeah. just, he died. just died. We know the tragic whole story, but back the then he was everybody. You know, he was uh, an extolled, um, revered person. He was among many Jews, right? So anyway, just a opposite take. We shouldn't judge for better, not just for worse, but for better as well, according to this guy, you, rabbi. As, Esther, you're you've you've underlined my point or the point that I brought up, which was that the Tzibur is that he can't be known him and Rishayim and poor Bernie Madoff, he was one of the Rishayim and he made his way into the Jewish community because he, he seemed to have a penchant for helping Hadassah and Yeshiva University and all kinds of big organizations and to convince them that he would make a lot of money for them and he stole it. Yeah, that's a great point. Oh, he great was example. in Russia. Well, he actually made money for people at the beginning. I mean, the, one of the reasons it went on so long was because he was able to, um, you know, satisfy a number of people. So it's a complicated story, but we don't want to get off on that <laughs> now. Okay. So I'm going to move on. 
It says, Al Tomar Davar She'ef Shar Lishmoa. Let me read the translation. Shesofo Lehishama. Do not say it is not possible to understand this, for ultimately it will be understood. Which means, I think, if you don't want something known, don't say anything. Don't say anything because ultimately it's going to be out there. And this sounds like somebody complaining about Facebook or LinkedIn because of information that's out there that maybe someone doesn't want out there. We live in an age where everything is out there. And yet here our sages from 2000 years ago are saying essentially the same thing. I invite your comments. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think you've nailed it. I think uh, you think that you're saying something that will be kept uh, private uh, and yet somehow the world learns about it anyway. Um, no, no, no secret is safe just because people uh, are people. Right. Uh, Ellen, did you want to say something or were you just raising your hand because you, you had a tick? <laughs> <laughs> and Esther, what do, what do your mavens, what did our Barvanel had to say about this? Uh, the um, the book is the all three all four things are interspersed so it's hard to uh, to come up with the the approach here all I can say is Rabbi Yosef Ibn Nachmias is in sharp dispute with Rambam who interprets do not say anything which cannot be understood to mean that one should not say something that cannot be understood immediately and it requires a great deal of concentration. But this rabbi disagrees. Is, it, is this not far-fetched from the substance of Hillel's maxim? Rambam himself is guilty of inconsistency when he makes a statement which is difficult to grasp. Um, so this rabbi Nachmayas concludes that what Hillel referred to was falsehoods which cannot be heard, accepted, is in parentheses, and which are proposed as truths. So make of that what you will. Well, I, it, I guess it means, uh... Lashon hara uh, is a problem even when it's spoken privately uh, to one person. Yes, I, I think, think that's, that's true. a very good yeah. summary. Meanwhile, I'm not used to having people badmouth the Rambam because the Rambam enjoys <laughs> this sterling reputation. Rambam is a very unusual and wonderful person. And I have to tell you just a personal story. I went to, I joined this thing called the Unity Mission years ago with Alan Tepero. And we went down to Yeshiva University and we went to the JTS and we went to the Reform, uh, I think it's called Hebrew Union College down by Washington Square. When we were at JTS, they took us to the famous library there and they passed around an Egeret, a letter that Maimonides signed, but he didn't write it. He had a scribe write it. And this was enclosed in plastic and they passed it around. I, 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 I just thrilled to this. This was, you know, something that's a thousand years old. And sure enough, it shows that people wrote the Rambam letters. What should I do about this? What should I do about that? And he writes back to them and he signs it. He doesn't do the writing himself. He has a scribe do it. Uh, Rambam was an outstanding individual. David Rosenson and I are in a class where we're studying the Mishnah Torah. And we started by studying a lot about cosmology because the Rambam laid out the cosmology of Aristotle about the music of the spheres and all of that, that today has been discredited. But the Rambam was, you know, batting from both sides. He, he knew his, 
He knew his Torah, he knew his Tanakh, he knew his Talmud. He was dynamite. Plus, he was working as a doctor. Well, you know, Rambam... That was only later in life, actually. Well, Rambam was, uh, is like my, my guiding spiritual light, but uh, we also don't, uh, we don't engage in hero worship. We know that even our, even our wisest sages were imperfect. Um, that only, only God is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, I read this famous letter that he wrote. Somebody wanted to come and visit him. And he said, I'm so busy. I've got to go to the Sultan's house all day long. And then when I'm back from that, I, I have my own patients who come to my place. And he just sounded like an irritated, overworked doctor. <laughs> I know the feeling. And um, yes, he's very human, very human indeed. And on Shabbat, he, he writes in this letter that he goes to the shul, he goes to the synagogue, and everybody's barraging him with questions about halakha and so on. He, the poor guy never had a moment's rest. Died yeah. very young. What? What's that? He died young. Yeah. Is that right? He also had to support his brother or something. I think his brother- got... no, The other way around, his brother supported him when the brother died. He had to support his brother's family. That's and what which I was- That's why yeah. he became a doctor. Right, he had to pay off his debt. was lost at sea. Oh, right. is that what it was? Right. He was on a on a on a boat that was bringing goods somewhere, and that boat was was lost at sea. Right. Yeah, I think the brother was a merchant of some sort. Merchant. That's right. right. So That's Maimonides right. didn't have a great life, is the point, and uh, but he still did become a great sage. Right. Uh, could could I, I, this is all fascinating, but can I go back to the sentence that we were discussing? Which sure. I'm not entirely certain that it means things like Lashon Hara. I think that there's something much more overall purvey, uh, that, that um, is being meant here. I. Don't say things in Hebrew. The, the verb is to hear, right. which I see can can be understood as to understand, certainly. Mm -hmm. But you see, don't say something that people won't understand. That's not lashon hara, not at all. I think so. What what exactly are they getting at? I think Judith that what what he's saying here, and this is what Rabbi Hillel is saying, is. If something is very complex, it is very likely to be misinterpreted. And you, you better not right. say it so that it won't be misinterpreted. Gee, well, I'll, yes, I'll but that's it. not Lashon Hara. Yeah. Well, I think I, I'm looking at the phrase, it says, Altamar Devar She'i Efshar Lishmoa. Doesn't say She'i Efshar Lehavin. Doesn't mm -hmm. say that you can't yeah. understand. It says that you that shouldn't be heard. Uh, uh, so yeah, but I, then look at the look at the second half of the sentence. Well, Yael, uh, Yael maybe can help us here. Oh, yeah, so I'm I'm reading a sort of same in Hebrew, and it says that in this context, um, lishmoa is to understand. Okay. So if uh, you think that something is so complex and you won't be able to understand it. Eventually, I my comment. Yeah. <laughs> but then, but the second half of the sentence is don't say things that well, it starts, don't say things that cannot be heard or understood in the hope, and, and that is understood, that in the future it will be understood. Oh, that's so funny because when I read this the first time, I took it as a mark of arrogance. Don't you say what I'm talking to you about is so difficult, no one else, forgive me, Maimonides, will be able to understand it because huh. trust assured in the fullness of time with you know, people and minds and knowledge, it will be understood. So I took it as an injunction against arrogance, but that was a first read. And then I started agreeing with the rest of you, but I thought that might be helpful for confusion. 
just have a few minutes left. Okay. Well, uh, isn't it great that we have, uh, what is it, seven or eight words that lend themselves to completely contradictory uh, interpretations? And and furthermore, I, I different translations as well. In the Tversky book, it's um, the translation is do not make a statement that cannot be easily understood, which to me is different from do not say it is not possible to understand this. And he then gives a great example of a therapy patient who's in denial. And there's no point in trying to explain to them what's going on because they cannot hear it. They are not at that point, but that eventually they may get to that point. Do not tell the patient anything which is he, incapable, he is incapable of hearing. Eventually, he will come to hear it himself. These are, you know, he says these are like the exact words of this Mishnah. Anyway, we, I can't even get agreement on the translation, nevertheless, the meaning. Yeah, Al, you want to say something? Uh, in the daily Siddur, I, I, um, the one we do every morning, it say, um, uh, hear my prayer, and it translated to um, uh, li not listen. Um, say it in Hebrew. Say it in Hebrew. Is it Shomer Atfila, the, the guardian of uh, prayer? No, no. Um, or listen to our prayer. It's not translated to listen. Um, I have to look up again. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, may I, folks, just in case somebody wants to sign off at the time that we promised them that they could sign off, I wanted to read the quotation from the last mission to tra tractate Makot that's read at the conclusion of each chapter of Pirkei Avot. And it says, Rabbi Hanina ben Akashia said, God wanted to confirm merit upon Israel. Therefore, uh, did he give them an elaborate Torah with many commandments? As it is written, the Lord chose to raise Israel in righteousness. Therefore, he did give unto them a Torah that is vast and profound. I right, thank, thank you. you all for joining us today. And if you want to continue, um, oh, I got to drop out too. Fine. Marty, if you want to move um, over to want to make me your co-host, I can do that. Go ahead. I can stay for a while. Do you know how to do that? Uh, to make you a co-host? Yeah, just make me a host or co-host. Uh, I can stay on if you need to How leave. do I do that? Okay, uh, hit participants. Go ahead, David. <laughs> okay, hang on. Yeah, and, I got uh, it. Next to Roberta's name, you'll see three dots. Um, Roberta's name. To, on, on the right. Oh. On the, right. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Or, uh, make make host. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom everybody, thank you so much. Sid, can't thank you enough. Well, thank you very much. It was a a pleasure. Wonderful. And again, the next time we're going to get back to Tehillim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes oh, yeah. it's less controversial and more poetic. Love <laughs> Tehillim. Right Shabbat after. shalom and Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.